So without further ado, I would like to introduce a Vitalik Buterin with Ethereum Gift to the World. Big round of applause, please. <laughs> Okay, yay, the thing works. Um, so um, today what I wanted to uh, talk, uh, talk about is basically moving uh, not so much about the things that I usually talk about, which is the kind of technology of how blockchains work, how Ethereum or Ethereum 2.0 will work, or kind of very, very specific applications, but more generally kind of the move that we've been seeing over especially the last year, but um, even more than anything else, of blockchain-based applications and of finally getting toward the tipping point where it seems like there's a lot of real things that are happening and uh, being... I have been told the hand mic is off. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> um, yeah, the useful th uh, useful things ha um, happening on top um, on top of uh, blockchains and kind of how to try to identify blockchain applications that could actually provide value in places where it would be difficult to provide that value with things other than blockchains. Um, so first, some history, right? This is kind of very rough, like five line map of the space. So. Um, first four years, basically blockchain equals Bitcoin. The, every, it was just called the Bitcoin space. I called it the Bitcoin space. Yay. Um, now, shortly after that, there's been, oh, and like, during that first time, right, um, basically Bitcoin, the currency, either as a store of value or like as a thing you would use to pay in restaurants or pay on the internet is basically the main thing that people were talking about in the blockchain space. So it was people were either talking about more efficient and cheaper disintermediated disintermediated peer-to-peer -peer payments or global remittances or censorship resistant payments or store of value applications like Bitcoin being the new gold and so on and so on and so forth. So it was mainly like really focused on like this fairly limited set of areas. Um, 2014 to 15, uh, the Ethereum project launch, uh, people also started talking a lot about quote enterprise chains and there was a lot of discourse about permission chains, this idea of blockchains that could kind of link bit large companies together and solve trust issues between uh, companies in different sectors. Um, 2016, uh, a lot of things continued happening, but also um, the DAO happened. Um, who here has heard of the DAO? <laughs> yeah, so uh, some guy decided it would be a good idea to try to make a decentralized investment fund in a smart contract, it raised a bunch of money, and it got hacked. And people apparently learned from this. Um, 2017 to 18, um, cryptocurrency prices went up a lot, there was a lot of tech development, and here we are kind of roughly now, right? So some of the things that I'll talk about today, um, one is kind of DeFi and kind of D things more generally, and one of the interesting benefits that I think we can get out of uh, this move toward kind of decentralized things happening on blockchains, which is composability. Um, serverless applications, and here I don't mean fake serverless like AWS or Lambda, I mean like real serverless, not having servers. Um, a, a recent blog post I made called um, Control as Liability, and talking about how especially in recent kind of legal and political environments, you have more and more advantages to building applications that whether they use blockchains or not, try to kind of keep control more in users' hands rather than concentrating it in one place. Um, Non-financial applications of blockchains, wh which is something that a lot of people are excited about in different areas. Um, the blockchain industry proving its usefulness by solving its own problems. Also, another way of thinking about what blockchains are good for, which is kind of engineering new kinds of institutions and kind of generally how do we get from here to kind of much more than here. Um, so who here has tried um, exchanging e um, either ETH or some ERC-20 token for some other ERC-20 token because you wanted to buy some? Um, who here has um, tried doing this on just a centralized exchange? 
who here has tried doing it on Uniswap? Those who've tried both, which experience is simpler? Yeah, so Uniswap is this interesting case study, right? Because it's this fully decentralized and serverless, meaning all it is is a smart contract. There's no operator, even if they, the team disappears tomorrow, it'll keep running forever. Um, a decentralized exchange. It sits on the Ethereum blockchain. Anyone can just interact with it. And we've been told that decentralization is something that you have to make a lot of sacrifices for. The decentralized things have to be more inconvenient, have to be clunkier, clumsier, and more expensive. And you have to do this because you get some nebulous benefit out of not having central controllers. Uniswap is interesting because not only is it decentralized, but it manages to be more convenient than all of the centralized stuff that came before it. So this is like one of the, these really interesting kind of things to be looking at, right? That you can s sometimes have blockchain applications that instead of seeing decentralization as this kind of weakness to work around, they basically see decentralization as a strength. They embrace it and they f build, build themselves kind of the blockchain way. And the benefit is you have this nice, really clean and easy tool and other people can just go and plug it and use it. Right? So humans can use Uniswap, which is nice, but it's also the case that like, other applications can use Uniswap, right? So you, know, you might ask, well, why, what, what is the benefit of building a decentralized exchange in this style of just being a smart contract instead of doing one of these semi-decentralized exchanges where you have some order book, some cryptographic signatures, and technically it's not custodial and, and no one can steal the funds, but actually there's some server that's running it and, and the server has to kind of stay, uh, stay online and keep running it for the thing to keep working. Um, so there's a few arguments. Um, one of them is um, this control as liability thesis that I wrote a blog post about a couple of weeks ago where the core idea is basically that because of things like uh, regulatory changes, um, because of changing global political environments um, and all of these uh, and, uh, other things that have been happening in the last 10 years across a fairly large variety of, uh, of internet industries, including kind of mainstream internet tech and including um, blockchains and finance and other areas. Um, having control, more control over user, your relationship with your users is basically moving from being a strength and something that you want to have because why not and it's an opportunity you can leverage to being a vulnerability and something you don't want to have because it's something that could lead to you getting sued, could lead to you being reg getting regulated, could lead to you getting hacked and actually facing consequences for it. Um, along with a whole bunch of these other issues, right? So if you make a centralized exchange, uh, you pretty much have to live like every day of your life in fear that you're going to get a wake up call at 3.23 in the morning um, and be told that your company is now bankrupt and you have to explain to everyone why they're only getting 63% of their money back. Now, if you build a decentralized thing and you f write, write the code, formally verify the code, design it in such a way that you don't have this kind of centralized pool of everyone's money, then a lot of these risks just reduce, right? So even you as, as someone who wants to build a product that helps people tr exchange one type of asset for another, like there's advantages to you in building it in this way where it is kind of fully user sovereign, user focused, and you, instead of being an infrastructure operator, are, really are just a software developer. So and this is the first part, right? The second part is that when no one owns it, then the community is more inclined to take ownership, right? And then other people in the community can more confidently build whatever they're building on top of the thing that you're building because they can be confident that it's something that even if you literally built it three weeks ago, is going to stay, stay on the test of time and is going to continue existing because it will continue existing for as long as it exists because it's just a smart contract. There's nobody that can kind of just disappear and shut down and make it go away. So 
this idea of, and of people making applications that talk to other applications, right? It's been around forever. Um, and you know, there's been entire businesses that built themselves on top of Twitter, built themselves on top of Facebook and all of these things. But one of the things that you hear from these developers is that like very often the quote platforms that they're building on if they build anything that's even remotely interesting, like the platforms just have an incentive to either just grab it for themselves or find some way to take their ability to build that product away, right? There's a lot of risk in building on top of a centralized thing. Whereas on a decentralized thing, it's a smart contract, you can plug into it, and you know that the interface in the future will be the same as the interface now. now you might not know how many users it's going to have in the future, but at least you know that it's going to exist. And at least you know that even if everyone else using the application stops using it, if you depend on it, like you personally can put resources toward making sure it stays usable. So applications kind of building on top of other applications and linking to other applications is something we've been really seeing a lot of um, in the last uh, six, is, few months and a year especially. So this is just one very, very small and very limited kind of sub map of just projects that I happen to know more about myself. But really this graph is much bigger and there's a lot of other, other things here that I totally forgot to mention. But be, like, just as a couple of examples here, right? You have Compound, which is this uh, kind of platform for lending and earning interest on tokens. And Compound created this token called CDI, and CDI is basically a wrapper around DAI, which is a token that's part of another applica um, application called MakerDAO. And so you have the CDI token. Well, guess what? You can then you also have um, Augur, and you Augur also uh, has a token called Wrap. Compound has a wrapper called CREP. And then if you use Uniswap, then Uniswap is. Um, has the, gives you the ability to trade Ether for CDI, so it's plugging into both of those at the same time. And then if you're using Kyber, it's really plugging into all three of them because Uniswap is one of Kyber's backends. So you have this kind of really nice ability for things to interconnect to each other. And the spirit of things being interconnected to this way in some ways is similar to the early kind of spirit of hyperlinking on the internet where you would have you know, web pages that kind of link and points to each other. Um, this is back in the days before we all gave up and just started screenshotting each other's tweets on Instagram. Um, and there's a lot of benefits from people publishing content in ways that kind of talks to other content and more generally things that people build, like being able to talk to each other kind of across user application or institutional boundaries. And the blockchain space is interesting because it's uh, at least this kind of aspect of the Ethereum ecosystem is bringing the ability to do that to the world of software. Now, in this case, to the world of financial software, but you could see it going far, far beyond, right? You could see this graph expanding and including ENS. You could see it including identity infrastructure. Um, you could see, I mean, the, in order for people to interact with any of this, they have to use wallets, and those wallets could interact, um, could have some mechanism for preventing theft. That mechanism for preventing theft could itself plug into some DAO in some cases. So you can get a lot of benefits out of these things being able to talk to other things. And decentralization is um, a big uh, factor in making this kind of structure more trustworthy because it reduces systemic risks, right? It reduces the possibility that there's one guy in some keynote somewhere in the graph, where if that one guy does something wrong or shuts down, suddenly a whole bunch of other things break, where users didn't even realize that they were trusting that one guy. So this is one of the kind of aspects of the uh, um, Ethereum space that I found find, find interesting, right? Which is that the killer app is not any one of these squares and circles. The killer app is the set of edges. Now, if you have n applications, then you have n squared edges, blah, 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 quadratic growth, yay, good, good trends. Um, so 
So, this, that, so that's one aspect, right? So here's another um, aspect of uh, the space which is interesting, right? So we talk a lot about like decentralized finance and it's legitimate to talk about decentralized finance as the first major big app because ultimately, like the, the reason it succeeded in this way is that the existing financial system is one of the more outdated and terrible industries out there, right? It's the industry where you have, uh, you have to wait like five days to receive money where you have, if you trust PayPal, they can like freeze your money for up to six months in some cases where moving money between different con different countries is extremely hard. You have, in any case, you have somewhere between like two and 6% fees and like remittances are hard and all, and all, and all of this stuff, right? Now, the, the, the terribleness of the, financial, uh, of the financial industry just is significantly greater than the terribleness of, say, email, right? Like, you don't hear about people having to pay middlemen 11% to send an email to their relatives in a country in Africa. Now, I mean, sometimes you have problems because like, if people can't understand, like, uh, don't have computers or don't have the skills to, to, to work with computers, but like if they do, like you just don't have that problem to the same extent. And so with a lower baseline, well, of course, blockchains can just can compete much more easily. And this is like part of why I think fi the financial space has been the space where blockchains have in the short term been more successful. But there's also this much bigger set of applications um, outside of finance. And one, so this is just one random example, right? This is a project in Singapore, which is using the Ethereum blockchain um, in order to just verify the authenticity of u university credentials. So the way that this thing works is basically that if you issue a degree to someone, then that's basically just a digital signature. So you just make a digital signature with your cryptographic key Anyone can verify the signature, anyone can verify the degree was issued. What you now, um, if you want to prove that the certificate is still valid, that it has not been revoked, then you go to the blockchain, you go to that smart contract, you run through the list of uh, revocations and you check that that particular certificate actually has not been revoked yet. So this, the idea here, right, is that cryptographic signatures prove that the thing was issued and checking the blockchain proves that it has not yet been revoked. Or more generally, we can think about it as cryptography providing proof of existence and blockchains providing proof of inexistence. So this is one kind of general pattern that you can see being used in a lot of different areas. You could see it being used in land registries. You could see it being used for preventing double spending of things other than money coupons, receipts, prescriptions, whatever, whatever. There's many thousands of kind of tiny use cases for things like this. So there's um, a lot of these uh, kind of different examples where you can think of blockchains not just as infrastructure for managing and moving money around, but as this kind of cryptographic tool for providing security guarantees and verifying claims about information. And money is really just one use case of this kind of tool of this of this um, design pattern, but you can apply the same pattern in all of these other areas as well. Um, ENS is one of the uh, blockchain applications that I've like continue to find interesting, and it's the one that's been in the space the oldest, other than money itself. So who here has uh, been around to remember Namecoin? Mm, 2010 blockchain-based uh, DNS thing. Um, ended up not really going very far, in part because it was realistically much too much too early and because the economics were bad. But now it's not much too early and the economics are better and there's ENS and there's some other uh, blockchain uh, and, and uh, Ethereum based um, domain name systems that are coming up. So here the idea is basically to, instead of uh, using the blockchain for 
uh, verifying that money hasn't been spent or that a certificate has been revoked, uh, use the blockchain to verify uh, who is the legitimate claimer of some domain, right? And this could be used to register websites. So like, you could use uh, vitalik.eth and have it points to a website. And then if someone uses an ENS um, enabled browser, I think Opera enabled ENS integration recently, but I'm not, sh I'm not sure on the details. Um, then you can just use it out like you would use any other DN uh, do domain name system and just access websites. But you could also use this as a name system for more general contexts, right? If you need an identifier, f that to, like a username to use for decentralized uh, chat applications, if you want to just assign a name or some short uh, name to uh, pieces of content, it's a very general purpose tool and you can use it for lots of things. So that is, um, so what benefit all of all of these things, right? So in the case of uh, using it for certificates, it's uh, easy to verify that certificates are valid. Checking a signature is basically free. Checking a blockchain is somewhat more complicated, but it's uh, not really expensive. It requires zero ongoing maintenance. So you don't have to maintain any infrastructure yourself and it has a very low cost. So to issue a certificate, the cost is zero. To revoke a certificate, the cost is just the cost of paying one transaction fee is somewhere between like one to 10 cents right now. And I mean, in the case of ENS, it's, um, I mean, there are costs. You have to pay transaction fees, but they're very low compared to transaction fees in the existing domain name system. And the costs for, ver for, act for reading the system are basically just the cost of reading the blockchain again, right? So there's definitely uh, uh, benefits just in terms of a system that's easy for anyone to kind of plug into and talk to. And blockchains definitely are kind of increasing in just convenience and your ability to use them fairly quickly, which is nice. Um, now, let's uh, talk about key revocation as an example more generally, right? So here's the problem, the kind, the problem that we're trying to solve. So I have some key, and this is a cryptographic key, we'll call the key K1, that I use to sign messages. This could be a PGP key, this could be some key that I use to sign, uh, that my website uses to authenticate itself to users. This could be a key that you use for, for any purpose. I, I suspect that the key might be compromised or I'm not uh, as confident in its safety. So I want to sign a message that says K1 is no longer a valid key, let's use K2 instead. Now let's suppose my suspicion was right and someone does manage to hack into K1 at some point in the future and they sign a message replacing K1 with K3. So in world one, the messages that people should interpret as coming from myself our message is signed with K2, right? Because K2 is the new key that I personally actually replaced um, the uh, message, replaced K1 with. Now let's look at world two, right? So this is another possible world that we might be living in. I have a key K1, I suspect it might be compromised and I sign a message replacing the key with K3. And so K3, instead of being the attacker's key, is now my key. And K2, instead of being my key, is the attacker's key, right? So the problem is that we have this kind of symmetry situation where there exists a key K1. Everyone agrees it's not the, it, the key is not valid anymore. But we have two messages. One of those messages replaces K1 with K2. One of those messages replaces K2 with K3. With, as someone verifying a message, how do I know which of those keys actually represents this person? How do I know which of these keys I should actually be verifying against? So now the solution that makes the most sense, right, is to favor the first one. So that way, at least if the, the key does get hacked, like you, you know that you would have to like, actually go tell people to replace it with something else. And if you do change your key successfully, then you know that the key was changed successfully and so you know that other people will actually trust this key. So you want, like, the simplest solution is to just figure out was the message replacing K1 with K2 first or was the message replacing K1 with K3 first? Problem is with cryptography, you can't really tell who came first. With blockchains, you can. So this is another example of like, how 
blockchains more broadly can be useful for kind of non-financial applications and in this case kind of securing key management. Um, we can generalize the concept even more um, and we can think about this in the context of the U cryptocurrency wallets, right? So managing kind of key revocation and key validity is a problem that the blockchain space solves, but it's also a problem that the blockchain space has, right? Who here holds cryptocurrencies? Um, who here has been scared that one day they wake up and, and their phone's been hacked and they don't have their cryptocurrencies anymore? Um, who here here has been scared that one day they'll just forget about, oh, forget about uh, their wallet for a couple of months and they'll try to remember it and they'll realize that either they forgot the password or they forgot to carry over the key, materi key material when they upgraded their phone or something happened and they lose access to their funds. So, okay. Um, can't, right, so key management is a problem that blog, like blockchain space has as well and it needs to be solved. Now, fortunately, within the blockchain space itself, there have been people thinking about solutions, right? So there's this uh, nice article um, from only about a month ago talking about how smart contract wallets and storing funds and storing, uh, managing your activity using an account which is a smart contract instead of an account which just is a single private, private key is likely to be the future, right? If you just have a, an account that is a key, then the key controls everything, and if something happens to the key, then you're, you're screwed, right? All of your funds, all of your activity, like your accounts just gets taken over. If you have your wallet be a smart contract, then you can come up with some more complicated scheme, right? Your smart contract can have rules. Those rules might say, oh, if you want to do this, you can do it immediately. If you want, but if you want to send more than a thousand dollars, then you have to wait 24 hours. And then during that 24 hours, there's some mechanism, and then that that transfer can be revoked. And oh, we're gonna have these three other keys. And if all three of those keys sign a message that says that this key has been hacked and it's no longer valid, then those three messages can approve a transaction that changes the key to something else. And so you can try to kind of have more complicated logic that's more robust because it tries to ensure this property that the system can recover from any single key in the inputs getting lost or stolen, right? So you can have a wallet and a kind of abstraction for your account, the thing that controls your assets and your activity, which takes advantage of the blockchain, right? So it is a smart contract and it uses the blockchain as this kind of stateful store of data to keep track of the order in which operations happened to maintain this abstraction that is much more robust against single keys getting hacked than a single key possibly could be by definition. So this is um, something that a lot of people are working on and there's people talking about social recovery, social revocation, um, vaults, 24 hour delays, all of these wonderful things. Um, and I, I'm definitely happy to see that like, after years of myself yelling at people to try to do more in this space, people are doing more in this space. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> um, DAICO is another interesting example. So I wrote this um, ETH research post about a year and a half ago, and the idea basically is that this was um, at the height of the ICO boom. And there were a lot of crazy ICOs, a lot of people getting way more money than they should, and a lot of, uh, a lot of projects failing. And there was this big incentive misalignment in the ICO space where you get your money at the beginning, but then after you get your money, you don't really have much of an incentive to make sure the project keeps on going. So the idea behind DA ICOs was to try to mitigate this problem in a, a de more decentralized way where the people who contributed to an ICO would control this uh, kind of tap mechanism where instead of uh, the project uh, creator getting the money immediately, the project's creator would get some tap and it would basically be some amount of ether they would get every second, every block or every day. And 
the people in, who funded the project have the ability to vote. So they can vote to either to increase the tap when the project proves itself, or if the, they decide the project become, is becoming a scam or is underperforming, they can all vote to just close the entire thing and proportionally return all the funds to themselves. So basically by doing this, right, you kind of protect against uh, the possibility that the project developers just kind of cheat all of the, um, all of the participants and uh, run away with the money because they just don't have the ability to access the money that quickly. So I came up with this idea. And for a while, I was unfortunately unhappy to not see anyone really picking it up. And I was even more unhappy the last few months when this horrible trend of IEOs started coming out, which seemed to be about as scammy as ICOs, except there's even more centralized intermediaries taking a 20% cut. Yay. Um, and, but now, you know, there's this um, wonderful, um, actually, uh, I forgot to include it, but there, um, Aragon um, recently announced um, this, uh, th uh, um, I think it was Aragon fundraising or something like that, where they're actually making an implementation of a fundraising gadget, which like they say is um, kind of inspired by the idea ICO concept. So yay, it looks like we might actually use like, decentralized autonomous things to solve the problems of the ICO space. So the general pattern I'm, I'm uh, going to kind of talk about here is this idea that if the blockchain space wants to prove to the world that it's useful and valuable, one great way to do it is to use the technologies and the ideals of decentralization of the space to solve the problems in the space itself, right? So one problem, it, money getting stolen on, from, on the exchange side. So Mt. Gox getting hacked, Bitfinex getting hacked, Quadriga getting hacked, everyone getting hacked. Well, let's not have single points of getting hacked, right? Let's talk about fully decentralized exchanges. If we have to centralize, let's talk about non-custodial exchanges. Okay, well, now we're putting more load on the users. So what if users get hacked? Well, net we can mitigate that by looking at smart contract wallets. Okay, well, ICO incentives are misaligned, right? Well, let's talk about DAICOs, let's talk about DAOs, let's talk about other mechanisms to help projects get funded while and of not having the problems uh, that you get from just throwing $20 million into one project. Um, fake accounts, scam accounts, um, scam, scam websites, scams in general, well, we can have centralized blacklists of who the scammers are and we can have MetaMask plug into the centralized blacklists and that's an improvement because it protects people. We can also think about decentralized mechanisms for constructing these warning lists so that they could be if it's potentially more, more responsive and less vulner vulnerable to abuse. So there's a lot of opportunities for the blockchain space itself and the ideas of decentralization to be turned around and be used as a kind of showcase of how decentralized and open solutions can solve real problems in the world and solve them in cases where centralized solutions have failed. Now, more generally, and this is kind of the final point I wanted to make, is that you can think of blockchains as being about money. You can think about blockchains as being about financial gadgets talking to each other. You can think about them as being this cryptographic tool for, not, for prevent, uh, verifying what facts about data. You can also view them as the sandbox for designing institutions, as a sandbox for designing tools and mechanisms for groups of people to collaborate on different kinds of projects. So these institutions could be used for raising funds for potentially profitable projects. They could be used for funding nonprofit public goods. So things like uh, Moloch DAO and the Git Gitcoin uh, grant CLR and all of these um, ideas making finance more efficient, managing identities. So you can you think of blockchains as a tool set where if you are working on solutions for any of these problems, well, it might make sense to kind of build your thing with some or all of its components run, like just running on a blockchain in some form because, well, it, it's there and it has like really, really nice properties and people, you, people are confident that whatever you put up there is going to stay, is going to stay there. So there's um, 
a lot of these really nice things that are getting built. Um, a lot of I also wrote this um, post uh, recently on um, infrastructure for um, uh, collusion resistant uh, mechanism design, which is basically this problem where you have many kinds of mechanisms, where things like voting, where you need to prevent people from being able to prove how they voted. And because if, if people can prove how they voted, then the mechanism becomes vulnerable to things like coercion and bribes. And it turns out that you can, uh, this is very hard to solve just with a blockchain, but, it's, but you can actually make some really nice solutions if you combine blockchains together with cryptography and together with other kinds of technologies. Right, so if you view blockchains as being this kind of one tool in a toolbox, then there is this other kind of even bigger set of applications that potentially become unlocked. So why aren't we there yet? Um, first of all, blockchains are slow and not scalable yet. Um, now, Casper is there to help, yay. Um, <laughs> blockchains are unscalable. Plasma is there to help, sharding is there to help, stateless clients are there to help, channels are there to help, yay. Um, privacy, uh, weird fancy moon math is there to help. Um, so security, smart contract wallets are there to help. Now as uh, we mentioned um, earlier today, there are challenges that are not technological. So one of the challenges, for example, is just ease of getting access to cryptocurrency, which is a kind of political and legal problem more than it is a technological one. So there's definitely things that can't just be solved by making the technology better. Though, uh, especially the political and legal problems, like it, we def we'll definitely have an easier time with them if we can kind of credibly show to people that you know blockchains are just about speculation. This is this ecosystem and technology uh, instead of technology is that you can use to build things that solve problems and help people. And these are all wonderful tools that we can use both in within the blockchain space itself and increasingly in wider society to actually do that. And hopefully people will actually do that. So thank you.